I see. Okay. Well, you know. Okay. Well, thanks to you, uh, loyal customers. Uh, <laughs> coming back for the uh, the fourth and final uh, discussion of some theory for hard processes. So there's the outline again. I just like to say uh, where where we are right now. We really began on this third part, and we'll try to summarize some of the main points of the third and fourth. I've done a little editing in the slides so we can boil it down to this uh, the length of time that's allotted here. So what we'll talk about in general terms, our idea is to take the ideas, uh, the, the goal is to take the ideas we've developed and to see how we can learn how they occur to arbitrary orders and perturbation theory. Okay, in particular, a main tool that we're going to be using is that local version, well, it is time order perturbation theory. And we'll see that by re-expressing amplitudes in the time ordered fashion, we're able actually to uh, uh, find qualitative features that will hold to all orders. And we introduced last time the idea of pinches as they appear in contour integrations doing uh, the uh, <clears throat> integrals uh, over momenta in, uh, in amplitudes. And we'll talk a little bit about power counting and how these ideas apply to amplitudes. And in particular, wide angle amplitudes, which simplifies the analysis quite a bit, where all momenta are in different directions. So it's like elastic scattering at fixed angle, things like that. And then at the uh, final part, we'll talk about how these ideas all put together help us to understand that jets cross sections in electron positron annihilation particularly are in fact infrared safe on their own. And we can calculate them from first principles in perturbation theory up to the kind of power corrections that we introduced last time. And we'll talk about also how this leads, leads us on the road to proving factorization of which we saw the important applications in Maria's lecture this morning and how this idea of evolution, DGLAP and uh, evolution in particular, arises out of the uh, factorized cross sections. And uh, finally, well, uh, just we'll touch on resummation, but most of what is in the notes of resummation will be in the slides, but we won't go into any detail uh, as we go along. We really have to skip over some of that. Okay, so having said that, Let's get started again by going basically to page. Here we go. This is the page that we uh, finished up the previous lecture on this morning. And just to say, okay, uh, here we have a couple of virtual corrections and we see that in dimensional regularization. So this is one of our QCD defined at long distances by a, a going to more than four dimensions. Our uh, amplitude here is, is written in terms of these infrared poles and some finite parts and complicated dependence upon epsilon. So uh, our question here should be phrased when we look at a calculation like this, where do the one over epsilons come from, okay? We want to learn how they came about in this diagram and we wanna learn how they come about in general at least for some classes of, of processes. And that's our goal in the next few slides here. <clears throat> and another one of these uh, things. Oh, yes. And now I, I should go to command L. Ta-da. Okay, good. <clears throat> so here was the infrared pole. Oh, this one we saw, on shell lines and a pinch of momentum contours. I won't go over this again. Uh, but we'll see what we're working for is, as announced last time, that we were trying to show the on-shell lines correspond to physical processes in the classical description, where the particles are just balls moving at the speed of light, basically. <laughs> okay, or point masses moving at the speed of light. So we'll start with examples and then generalize. So here's our first example. This example is a two-point function. So just to really be clear, hopefully, about what we're looking at, this is a two-point function with momentum P flowing in. 
And this, these are truncated. There are no, we're not worried about the external propagators. And then we have one propagator carrying momentum K and another propagator carrying momentum P minus K. And that's what we have up here. Well, what we can do with any of these Ks and the P minus Ks is simply express uh, the propagators as a product of two, uh, two linear uh, factors uh, minus the uh, values of the energy uh, which put the line on shelf. So we get K naught minus here absolute value K. Actually what I've done, this second line is set to mass to zero. Okay, so this mass should be set to zero. This equality is only true for zero mass. But this, instead of being absolute K, would be the omega that we had before, the on-shell mass. So it's K naught minus K plus I epsilon, K naught plus K minus I epsilon. And then here it's K naught minus P naught minus the absolute value of K minus P plus, and then K minus P with a minus. So there are four poles here, okay? And you can see if you have n denominators, are going to be two n poles. So, I mean, it's not beyond human comprehension to understand what's going on. So for generic values of the position of the pole is determined by the absolute value of K. P is fixed, okay? So for a given P, as the as a K vector varies, these poles move in, in the complex plane either slightly above or slightly below the uh, real axis. And so we can label them, uh, well, one, two, three, four. I, I think on the next slide, we see what they are. But each of these little uh, poles here, the position of the poles corresponds to one of these denominators. So I hope that's clear what we're doing. So generally, well, okay, what I should say here, Generally, for generic values of K, the poles are separated. And since this is a defined as a, a, a contour in the complex plane of obviously, this is a meromorphic function, uh, we never need to come near one of the poles. If there's a pole over here, we go above. The pole down here, oh, well, let me go down into the lower half plane to avoid it. Here I go back to the upper and again into the lower. So in general, we don't know much about this, but we know that integral is finite, okay? There's no ultraviolet problem here in integrating over K naught because uh, you have four denominators. So it goes down like K, one of K naught to the fourth. So this integral is simply going to exist as a finite number, which you could get a computer to compute if you didn't want to do the partial fractions necessary. On the other hand, when the vector K goes to some fraction of vector P, where X is a positive fraction, then the pairs of poles one and four and two and three pinch like this, okay? They come together with the same real value, but a plus or minus I epsilon, okay? Where of course that I epsilon is something that we think is numerically equivalent to zero, but just telling us which half plane. So here, the pole at one is at K naught equals XP. That was K itself, but now it's XP minus I epsilon, which is XP naught if, uh, if P is on, on, on the, is itself uh, a light-like vector. So here we actually, we are choosing P squared equal to zero just to illustrate these points. Okay, so the pole one, which is at this point, is pinched by pole four, and here they are represented. And pole four is a little bit more complicated. It's K naught minus equals P naught minus X P vector minus P vector. But because P vector absolute value is P naught, this is just P naught one minus one minus X, which equals X P naught, which is of course the same as this position. Okay, so this requires two things. One, it required that P squared be zero, or you wouldn't get this pole. So for P squared not equal to zero, this thing doesn't have any pinches, period. But if P squared does equal zero, the pinches occur, but they're at a very special place when K vector is proportional to P vector. And what kind of singularity is this? We had two, two different kinds. It's collinear, okay? This is obvious, yeah, this, what could be more collinear, right? And, and this is how it happens. 
This is how collinear singularities arise from the point of view of the integrals themselves. And if you had a computer that was, you tried to get it to compute this thing, it would be at these points where it would run into trouble. Okay, so notice how it only works for x between zero and one. If, if uh, you can see that these absolute values can't be replaced by these things. If for example, x is too big uh, or x is less, uh, um, xp is, is negative, something like that, this would then be one plus x for the absolute value. So that says that this x itself is between zero and one. You have a kind of part-time picture from the self-energy, this light-like self-energy, where one parton carries x fraction, the other is one minus x, both are positive, and that's when they're really both collinear. So, but what we're, now we're sensitive to on shell behavior. So this particular point's pretty obviously, oh, it says collinear, so, okay. All right, so, that gives us a sense of how collinear singularity occurs in the simplest case, this, this particular diagram. Now let's look at another diagram, a triangle diagram. Okay, I don't have a picture of it up there, but in this case, we'll have uh, something like this. We'll have P1, I think, coming in, and P2 going out. K going around like this. So the one line is momentum K. Oh no, K, I'm sorry. Uh, K is going this way, okay? So K is like this. This is line P1 minus K. This is P2 plus K. Oh, no. Uh, oh, okay. I, I take it back. The kinematics is just slightly different. This is the way it's chosen on, on the screen, it's the same diagram. Here we have, let's say P1 minus K. So K is going like this. This is K going up and here it's P2 plus K. Okay, so we're just doing this particular diagram here. It's a time-like rather than space-like. Uh, configuration for if P1 and P2 were both on shell with positive energy. So we say, okay, the way to think about this one, let's, you know, there are numerous ways to think about it, but now what we'll do is we'll apply Feynman parameters because this will lead us to a very general result uh, for the analysis of diagrams, which are called Landau equations. And so when you apply Feynman parameterization, I'm hoping everybody is familiar with this identity, which is true for every individual point in momentum space. All you have to do is do the alpha integrals and you get the original form for this diagram. And so now instead of three different denominators, we have one denominator cubed. What an amazingly clever idea, okay? So this D would be alpha one times k squared, that's just, okay. So alpha two, p one minus k squared, alpha three, p two plus k squared, and plus i epsilon. Notice that plus i epsilon. This, you see, when you're combining these propagators, there's an ambiguity in how you do it. You could always say, oh, I'll multiply times minus one and let one of the propagators get a minus one. And so I could make this alpha one k squared minus alpha two, p one minus k squared. But if you did that, the price would be that the i epsilon, instead of coming in with the sum of the alphas, which is one, would come in with a difference, something like alpha one plus alpha three minus alpha two. That would make this essentially almost useless <laughs> because the poles here would be skipping all over the place depending upon the alphas. So it's there, our desire to have this i epsilon coming without any alphas multiplying it that enables us to really define what relative sign we use to combine the three denominators. If you multiply them all times minus one, then you just get minus d cubed times minus one. So it would be the same thing. Okay, but this is actually quite profound and it's hardly ever mentioned. So d now, now so, okay, so where can we get a pinch? Well, it has to be from someplace where D vanishes. 
But D is just a quadratic form. It's very simple. It's a quadratic equation in K. So to set D equal to zero. But also it has to be that we have to have a pinch. Now the pinch means there has to be a zero of D which pinches all the contours, okay? Now, the way to think about that for a quadratic form is you require that the two solutions be at the same place. But that means, if you think about it, that the first derivative of D, that D vanishes and that the first derivative of D vanishes. And it has to vanish with respect to every loop that appears in D. Because if you had one or every component of the loop that appears in this case in D, because if one component didn't satisfy this, it would be the component for which the poles were separated. But if the poles are separated for any component, you could always do that component first. And if you did that component first, you would be along a contour which came didn't come close to any poles. So it would be finite. So we wouldn't have to do any of this stuff. What's that? Why did D need to be vanished? Oh, D, well, we're looking for infinities. Not infinities from infinity, but infinities in the integral. The only way the integral can diverge is if the integrand diverges. And the only way this integrand can diverge is for D to equal zero. See how simple it is? But the beauty of it is this is one loop, but this is gonna to apply to all loops. Okay, I, as you can see, I love this stuff. All right, so anyway, D buddy K mu of this. Well, we can all do that. It's alpha one K plus alpha two P one minus K. Actually, it's actually minus alpha two P one minus K. Anyway, plus alpha three P two plus K equals zero. So we get a linear equation like this in K. And so what we need is for this linear equation to hold to get a pinch because when it holds, if D equals zero, D after all is quadratic. It's just K minus the position of the pole in K times K plus the position of the pole in K. And so when it's only when those positions of the pole uh, reach the same or K minus the first position, the position of the first pole times K minus the position of the second pole. And when those two are together, the first derivative vanishes, and that's the only way you can get a pinch. Okay. So there is actually a physical reinterpretation of this, which we can see by looking uh, carefully at this one loop, and we can also generalize it, which we'll do on the next slide. So the physical reinterpretation says, okay, I'm gonna, and not worry about that minus sign. So it's K1, uh, alpha one K plus alpha two P one minus K alpha three P two plus K equals zero. This can be reinterpreted by a velocity times a time for the first component of this equation, the second component and the third component. So the times are interpreted as the very, the value of alpha, which satisfies this equation given the momentum involved, and uh, a set of velocities, which are the standard kind of velocities for a four momentum. The velocity is just Q mu over Q naught. So it's one for the zero part of the velocity, and uh, it's Q vector over Q naught for the other parts of the velocity, the other components, spatial components of the velocity. And if you ask, when can this be uh, satisfied? It could be satisfied for k mu equals zero with alpha over two equals alpha three over alpha one, alpha two over alpha one equals alpha three over alpha one equals zero. This corresponds to the soft. So uh, that's, uh, okay, let me just say that that's, there is a solution at k equals zero. And you could see it because basically you say, oh, let alpha two and alpha three go to zero. And then we have alpha one K, but if K equals zero, regardless of what alpha one is, it could be one in particular, there is the value one, K equals zero is already a solution. So it's a pinch, okay? In fact, whenever a line momentum vanishes, the two poles associated with that line momentum always coincide and pinch the contour. 
So that's the, the soft pinch is something very special. It comes from a single propagator vanishing, and that's all you need. So that's great. That's where the soft pinch comes from. Then there are collinear A and collinear B, and here are the solutions. K is proportional to P1, say some zeta here instead of X before, but it's just a letter. Or uh, K equals zeta P1, and that makes sense because here, if K is zeta P1, we see that the outgoing momentum, which is P1, is made up of a zeta P1 from K and a one minus zeta P1 from P1 minus K, okay? And so it's two collinear lines coming together to form the outgoing one. So now what happens to the other guy? Well, if K is parallel to P1, then P2 plus K squared is a large finite object. Okay, so this guy cannot be on shell. And the solution corresponds to the Feynman parameter associated with this. And therefore the time in this reinterpretation of the Landau equations equaling zero. Okay, so uh, the alpha three would equal zero uh, in, yeah, in this one. Uh, K is zeta P1, alpha three equals zero. And we have this connection between alpha one and alpha two, which reinterpreted in terms of time says the time and velocity, which is the distance traveled by particle P1 minus K and the distance traveled by particle K are actually the same. They have, okay, so yeah. So, when that happens, you say, well, how can that be? The reason it can be is because alpha three is zero. So in other words, this line P2 plus K doesn't travel anywhere. It's local. It lives for an infinitesimal amount of time. And our picture, sometimes called a reduced diagram, is this P1 minus K, K, P2. And this, is a essentially point-like interaction at this point. So, yeah. Yes, yes. Well, this is this is like one of these uh, standard model effective field theory operators. In some sense, the evaluation of this one-loop diagram tells us that oh, there's a sort of effective field theory where. Uh, particle P2 is produced at short distances, and then a pair is produced at also at short distances, but it comes together and forms an outgoing uh, particle. And so we could have a, a pinch associated there and uh, a pole. So the description of this particular source of infrared divergences is kind of like an effective field theory. But... Oh, yeah, these things are neat. Okay, so here are the portraits. Uh, this is kind of like collinear A, and here that's like collinear uh, P1. And here we've shown like a little distance for P2, but this is a distance of order one over the energy. So it's almost point like for B, this is the case where K would be uh, negative. In other words, K wants to go this way instead of that way. And if K is defined as clockwise, this would be negative K coming in. So P2 minus K is less than P2, but proportional to P2, K gives the rest and out comes P2. And we just flip this diagram over to say what the physical picture is. So notice these are physical pictures inside the integration, inside the integral. The Feynman integral contains these and they contribute to the Feynman integral additively. So if we talk about making a list of all the pinch surfaces, soft, collinear A, collinear B, one may be a limit of the other. So in other words, when K is collinear and then K goes to zero, that brings us to the K equals zero pinch surface. And then from the K equals zero pinch surface, we, we can also reach it from the P2. But P, the collinear to P2 and collinear to P1 don't overlap in the K integral. They're different places where we get these, these components. So we have a handle then on where, the component, where these contributions are coming from. And that handle can be thought of in terms of this reinterpretation of distances times velocities. 
but distances times velocities are, I'm sorry, times times velocities, right? <laughs> times times velocities give distances, right? So these are actually the general Landau equation here is the statement that as you go around the loop, you come back to the same place. It has that interpretation. And that interpretation was realized long ago by uh, Coleman and Norton as being in fact, very much generalizable from one loop to any loop order. Right, because, oh no, we have a pinch. The pinch is at k equals zero. This has two poles and they're both in the same place because k vector is equal to zero. So it's really one over k naught plus i epsilon times one over k naught minus i epsilon. And in fact, in the region where k equals p1, we get two poles here. But in QCD, that doesn't cause any problem because this would be a fermion for QCD and a, and a zero momentum fermion is suppressed by the numerator. So we'll see how that kind of consideration comes in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, this is, by the way, slide 76. And we're gonna do a little bit more detail for the next few slides. Then we're gonna slide over <laughs> some other slides, which you could look at uh, in more detail, but we're not going past 111 today, okay? So it's not as, you know, it's not going on forever. All righty, so the generalization is easy. And these, this here is a summary of what are called the Landau equations, which are requirements. They're essentially necessary requirements for a, a pinch. To, in other words, for a pinch to occur and to be a region where it is the integrand in general will diverge. Of course, the integrand to get a, a singularity in the function, the integrand has to diverge fast enough to be not integrable. And those are the long distance contributions that we need to get under control. So the statement is that either lines are on shell. So this isn't some line momentum, not loop momentum. Uh, the line is on shell, L squared equals M squared, which for us is essentially L squared equals zero for most of our considerations. Or if the line is not on shell, the alpha should equal zero. And alpha equals zero, as we know, because of this proportionality between alphas and times, means that this particle does not propagate a finite distance. And here are the linear equations for each loop. As we go around the loop, we have uh, the alpha i times the li. So we're taking the derivative of a line momentum with respect to a loop, which flows through that line momentum. We're not now, okay, it has to be admitted, it's possible to imagine even more complicated things where loop momenta are split in some way, but that's not what we're gonna do. Everything either has a loop or not a loop, but the loop momentum comes in with a plus or minus, so there's a sign there, and the sum of these equals zero. So here's a quadratic equation that sets some lines to zero, and here's a, an equation which is uh, a linear equation. And now using that reinterpretation that we had of the alphas being the time a particle propagates times the energy of that particle multiplied by the velocity. So we have a time times the velocity. We get an equation around any loop. This linear equation is an equation in terms of, if you, you can imagine a vertex, you'd simply assign the vertex point x2, or say we start say at x1. And, and then we say, okay, we have a, a position, the set of line momenta and values of alpha that satisfy the Landau equations. And we say, okay, well, we can look at uh, the direction and the time where uh, the particle going here uh, is moving uh, according to this alpha, uh, alpha i l i, which is a delta t i times v i, we go from x1 to x2, x2 to x3, dot, 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 and we go all the way to xn. Or we could go in the other direction, starting at, at, at x1 and then going to n, or from n to x1 if we multiply times minus one. And including these epsilon ISs here, the sign that says whether 
<clears throat> the loop momentum is going along the line momentum or opposite it, what we find is a, re a condition on any of the loops that no matter which way you go, you get to the same point. That's the condition that the sum of the deltas should equal zero, which says that this is free propagation of mass of particles on shell particles. Okay, this applies whether it's massive or massless. And everybody who uses massive quantum field theory knows massive is much more complicated than massless. And this, this is no exception. This is extremely simple for massless, Extre and, but gets very, very complicated for massive. So we're only gonna talk about massives here in the remainder of this, of this lecture. Okay, so that's kind of where we're standing. Uh, any question or... Of course, to really believe it, you have to do it yourself, but really it's all just linear equations. It's not even linear algebra. I mean, it's just looking at what linear equations say. So in particular, uh, the soft region for a triangle with massless scalar quarks. <clears throat> so just to make it a little bit simpler, um, we can choose uh, P1 in the plus direction. So I am assuming that people are familiar with the light cone variables and P2 in the minus direction. So we get P1 plus K minus minus KT squared plus I epsilon. That's our, uh, our uh, K, P1 minus K squared. And uh, this is P2 plus K squared. And then um, P, uh, K plus, uh, and this is just K squared here. And then what we can do is we could say, okay, suppose we uh, we're interested in the soft limit. So what we'll do is we'll just use a, a variable lambda to scale the K mu's to zero and see what happens. And so we could insert unity in the form of an integral over lambda squared up to some value, the maximum value doesn't really matter, of lambda squared minus the sum of the k mu squareds. So we're just gonna scale k mu to zero to look at which, okay, which singularity we look at when we do that. I mean, you know, soft, right, exactly, thank you. Okay, good. So the soft singularity. And so we get a uh, lambda squared, lambda to the number of dimensions that we're in. This comes out of just changing variables from d four k to d lambda dk with the delta function. These then kappas all sum to one, and we're integrating over this, and we integrate over lambda. And uh, yeah, we take a, a one over lambda from the delta function. And then each of the denominators is of the form lambda times two P one plus. Now we have the kappa integral. And then the KT squared part is order lambda squared. So we can, to some extent, have, you know, neglect it. And, uh, uh, for that's for the P1 minus K squared, the P2 plus K squared is like this, and the K squared is this, but notice that the K squared term gives us a lambda squared. So we have a lambda here, a lambda there, and a lambda squared here. And what we get after all this, uh, we're getting a one over lambda. Uh, so we have the integral D lambda over lambda to the five minus D just by factoring out the factors of lambda that we have. We had a, oh yeah, a, a lambda to the minus two from the delta of lambda squared. So we, we see what we get here in terms of the scaling variable, d lambda over lambda to the five minus d. So if d is greater than four, what can we say about this integral? If d is greater than four, the integral as lambda goes to zero is, it's a word that begins with F and it's a nice word. <laughs> well, here, the lambda integral can be done, okay? So <laughs> the lambda integral is one over four minus D. So if, well, okay, it's hard to tell from this one. So this is a one over two epsilon pole, but if D is greater than four, that D is reducing the power in the denominator, okay? If D were greater than five, it would be a positive power. But as D approaches four, you get lambda to the five minus four, which is one over D lambda over lambda. 
And that's our, uh, that is a logarithmic divergence in the soft limit, which we can identify by this kind of scaling. It's this kind of, of uh, consideration which underlies uh, th the, uh, the, the method, it goes by the name of soft collinear effective theory. You do this so that you, you build these into the Feynman diagrams. Here we're looking at the full Feynman diagrams and finding this kind of scaling in them. Is there anything here you say, what about that? Or, you know, is it, there, it is true that, you know, these are all, uh, formulas that, that require attention and we hardly have time to give each, each one the attention it deserves. But by doing this scaling, we can recognize this overall singularity. Now, however, we notice, by the way, we get one over kappa plus and one over minus kappa minus. So this says there's something going on when one of these kappas gets small. And that's uh, those are the overlap of the soft and the collinear singularity. So the remaining integrals actually uh, are pinched at kappa plus or minus equals kappa t squared equals zero. And hence, kappa minus plus equal to one, uh, which comes from this delta function here, or the delta function here. So these are the soft tail of collinear regions that give the double poles that we saw when we did this kind of integral. So this kind of consideration where we use scaling to evaluate, to get a sense of, well, if it's singular, how fast does it diverge, can be generalized uh, to an arbitrary integral and an arbitrarily high uh, set of a loop order. And basically it, it comes to something like this. And I just wanna get the idea across the next couple of slides. There are too many equations for us really to discuss in the time we have remaining. But we imagine that there's some space represented kind of here <laughs> as the space containing some surface. And this surface is a surface where the contours are pinched. Okay, so this is called a pinched surface. It's labeled here S. And in any pinched surface, you can imagine, uh, you say, well, it's a surface. So it has, it has uh, coordinates inside the surface and it has coordinates that are proportional to the surface. When you move inside the surface, you go from one set of, of one point where the denom some set of denominators vanishes to another point. But when you go normal to the surface, you're going away or back toward the actual singularity. And it's the behavior of your integral in terms of these perpendicular variables, what's sometimes called normal variables, well, normal like the normal to a plane, uh, which uh, gives you a handle on estimating or getting bounds on the kinds of uh, singularities you can have. And we saw that in the last example, the uh, normal to the surface, what in fact the surface in that case was k equals zero was actually a point. So the normal to the surface, there were four variables surrounding that point in four dimensional space corresponding to each of the momenta of k. And by scaling all of them, we could see that the integral was in fact logarithmically singular. And we can do this much more generally. Okay, and so uh, here, this is what the integration looks like schematically. There are a bunch of denominators. They depend upon these L's, which are our uh, so-called intrinsic variables so in, and these kappas perhaps, which are normal variables. There's a numerator factor, there's a denominator factor. And you scale the normal variables in different ways to see which ones give you uh, have the potential of, of identifying singular surfaces. So the next couple of slides explore this. this uh, the idea here is that to notice that given some kind of scaling, both the numerator and the denominators will scale as a, the, a leading value of lambda. So they'll vanish in general as some power of lambda as we go to the pinched surface with corrections that are order lambda. And from that, you can find a leading behavior by neglecting these powers of lambda and just asking what happens as I scale to the pinched surface, okay? 
Now you might say, oh, suppose I scale faster in some set of variables than others, isn't it much more complicated? Well, yes, of course it is much more complicated, but in fact, you've got a big handle on this because you can ask yourself in these reduced integrals, to reduced denominators and reduced numerators, whether the reduced denominators have any pinches themselves, whether in fact some of the variables are in, are in, in fact being pinched more rapidly than others in some regions. So then you can look at those regions. What happens though in these uh, massless cases is that effectively, in particular in E plus E minus annihilation to jets, okay, we're about halfway through, we're doing moderately well. Uh, <laughs> E plus E minus annihilations to jets, that every time you find another pinch, it was just like the ones you saw before. And so you have an essentially recursive construction on, on, uh, on demonstrating the, the finiteness or the boundedness in terms of a given uh, power. So really what matters is the volume of the normal variables, in other words, how many there are, plus there, and we'll see, numerators may vanish, and uh, denominators may vanish. Numerators, when they vanish, it gives a suppression. Denominators give an enhancement. If, so you have then just by counting powers of the, from denominators and numerators, plus the volume of the number, of, which is just due to the number of, of variables you have to set to zero to reach the pinch surface, you have a dimensional contribution plus a numerator contribution, plus a set of contributions from each of the denominators, where this NJ is just the power of lambda that appears as you approach the pinch surface. So this, I hope, at least gives you a sense that there is a geometric way and not, you know, algebraic geometry or something, just kind of s simple uh, Euclidean geometry of evaluating these things. And so what we do is we repeat for all the pinch surfaces of an arbitrary graph. And you might say, well, isn't that awfully complicated? How do you know what's going on? Well, what we're gonna see in a minute is that the pinch surfaces are very simple to characterize for hard scattering processes in QCD, in deep and elastic scattering, in E plus E minus, and in hadron hadron. So in fact, the enumeration of all these gammas, all the gammas are basically telling the same story of collinearity in a direction where jets may appear in the final state, or in the case where you have hadrons in the initial state, collinearity to those hadrons, and the emission of soft particles. And that's basically the only thing that there is. So uh, if the pinch surface is already counted, it provides bounds on the, the graphs, and classifies infrared poles in dimensional regularization. Uh, this E plus E minus is simple. We can actually show that appropriate things are finite, which we're going to do in a minute. Hadron, hadron is more complicated. That's why we need, uh, oh, well, in fact, the, the surfaces in hadron, hadron scattering are more complicated. I'm just going to mention globular regions. I can tell you in the break what they refer to, but we're not gonna deal with them here, but they cancel when we sum over states. So it's okay, in, at least in the, uh, the kinds of hard scattering cross sections that are being talked about here. So the massive case is similar, but there are more regions because the mass in, in, in provides at least one extra scale and, and often many extra scales. So as long as this P gamma, our counting is greater than zero for each pinch surfaces, the integrals are infrared safe. So in some sense, the search for long distance behavior is a search for P gamma equals zero, where we get the logarithmic singularities that we know characterize QCD. Uh, just take a break. This is, uh, I hope not going too fast. Okay, here, let me just, um, uh, there's a discussion in the next few slides of wide angle scattering. So we can imagine this is P1, P2 go to P3, P4. If we can make these on shell, this could be quark quark scattering, glue glue scattering. It could be two to three, two to four, whatever. As long as in this case, we're considering the, the, the situation that all these P's are in separate directions. And the absolute most general pinch surface is one in which 
Each of these incoming and outgoing lines is associated with a set of virtual particles which share its momentum. And all of those virtual particles have to come together at the same place where the momentum is transferred. And that momentum being transferred is essentially a local operator and is exactly the kind of local operator you get in standard model effect field theory, for example. But of course you can get these local operators by calculable QCD corrections or at higher orders, not so calculable QCD corrections, but they are point-like from the point of view of long distance behavior. And all of these collinear singularities are dressed by soft gluons attaching in all possible ways. Okay, so this is the most general pinch surface. And again, okay, why is it the most general pinch surface? Because these two lines are approaching at the speed of light, the only way they can transfer momentum is all of them coming together in the same place. Notice it's not sort of a vague statement. The Landau equations tell us with this physical reinterpretation, this is an exact statement, that the pinch will occur only when all of these lines are exactly collinear and when sets of these collinear lines meet at a single point. And inside that H, all the alphas are zero. So from this approximation, all of them are at the same point in space time. And then as particles go out in space time, these two particles, P3 and P4, are receding fr from, from each other, or the sets of particles that eventually will recombine into P3 and P4 are receding from each other at the speed of light. There's therefore no way for them to meet again and exchange finite momentum. These S here can't carry finite momentum, because it obviously wouldn't be pinched. There's no, no particle can travel along the light cone from a point here in P3 to a point here in P4 when these points left H at the same time. There just is no way to do it. So absolutely to all orders in perturbation theory, this is the set of pinch surfaces for a gauge theory. And what makes it the gauge theory specifically is the fact that these soft lines when they don't attach to H, in fact, it can give a, uh, a, uh, a leading power contribution. Well, so then, um, yes. The three are still going in different directions. This is by assumption, this is wide angle, right? So we're not letting them go parallel to each other. So when they're opposite like this, you know, any pair of them, you can go to a frame where they're back to back. So from their point of view, they're receding from each other. Every pair is receding from each other at the speed of light. In any uh, set of physical pictures that you can derive from satisfying the Landau equation. Soft, the wide angle, the K equals zero, it, so it could exchange color, but it could never exchange momentum at the pinch surface, okay? And in other words, you say, well, why can't they exchange momentum? To exchange momentum, they'd have to come together at a point because you'd have to exchange a gluon that's off shell. So what you'd have to do is something like, oh, we go out, let's say in the Y direction, and then we, oh, sorry, we, we, we really want to go out in the Z direction. So, okay, let's do this, but you can't do this. <laughs> They can't do this because they're going at the speed of light this direction. So there's simply no way to come back. Okay. So uh, the next few slides give examples. This is an example for phi to the fourth. And you do a little bit of power counting with these normal variables. And you find out that <clears throat> there are no soft singularities in phi to the fourth. So the pinch surfaces are actually much simpler. They're this form without any soft. And then a little bit more power counting tells you that you can't have several lines here. I mean, there are pinch, pinches associated with having many partons meeting at the hard scattering. But in fact, when you do the power counting, you find out that they're all finite integrals. That the only divergent integral is in fact from self energies. And the self energies, they'll cancel this extra on shell particle here in the renormalized theory. And so they're logarithmic singularities. So this then takes the form in, in, at, in a form that 
includes all of the uh, short distance of long distance behavior, that the amplitude can be written as a hard scattering function, which in the limit of uh, large uh, Q over M, we can neglect the mass in the hard scattering function times four functions, which are essentially self energies, which are jet so-called jet functions in which all the mass appears. And with a little bit of effort, because uh, the jet functions can be thought of as matrix elements, you can derive a renormalization group equation for this set of, of, uh, of uh, um, elas uh, exclusive processes. Uh, this can be done by an argument that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about when we get to DGLAP evolution in a minute. And so let me just... Uh, mention this uh, in passing. But I hope I've, I've given you some idea of the motivation. So now elastic scattering gauge theories, this is several uh, trend slides here, but I don't want to dwell on them. Here we take into account the idea that we could have these zero momentum gluons because we have essentially because they're three point couplings and five fourths, you just lack that. And so that improves the power counting. And uh, the power counting is described here. It's a little bit complicated. Unfortunately, we won't be able to, uh, to go into the details, but if you want to have a look at it, um, you can do so. And of course, send me an email or something. It's, it's something that doesn't seem clear or seems ill-defined. And um, it could be there's a typo or it could be I can direct you to uh, some particular place where it's explained in more detail. Um, the thing that is worth pointing out here is what happens with these multiple lines. In Phi to the fourth, the multiple lines were replaced by a single line. In the gauge theories, that's the case if you use what's called a physical gauge. But in the gauges we like to compute in, like the Feynman gauge, there are extra lines here. But these extra lines all correspond to the picture shown at the bottom, where we have the extra lines are all scalar polarized lines, which uh, we talked about, well, some of us talked about at the end of the last. And these scalar polarized lines are unphysical polarizations and they uh, decouple from the cross section, but in the factorized uh, functions, they're present that to make them gauge invariant. Uh, the proof of factorization is summarized in this, this picture, which is from an old paper. Uh, we won't have much time to talk about it, except I just want to emphasize that the effect of all of these scalar polarized connections is given by so-called gauge link or Wilson line, which is described in this slide. It's a path ordered exponential of the gauge field dotted into some fixed vector. And so it describes the so-called iconal connections. Each of these denominators is a one over n dot k, and each vertex is an n mu. So what actually happens in some sense to a jet of particles, in this case for elastic scattering, but also for parton distributions, the whole rest of the world is just a gluon source that it's just gluons coming from the opposite direction. Okay. And those are summarized by these Wilson lines. And, and in fact, they, as we'll see in just a second, they appear in, in parton distributions. Okay, there's more here, but time is short. So let me say what you end up with, because here this also makes uh, contact with what you've seen before from the effective theory models, uh, for the extensions of the standard model. The wide scattering amplitude for QCD is four jet functions. Okay, this is the general picture of uh, the leading behavior. It's four jet functions, a short distance function, and then soft functions, which themselves are uh, in, in the color representations of the external particles. So they could be in the three representation for quarks, three star for antiquarks, or eight for gluons. But we have Wilson lines for all of those. And the soft radiation that we get that isn't included in the jets is all uh, associated with these four colliding Wilson lines. 
And the Wilson lines can be tied together with, with or without color exchange, depending upon uh, the colors of the external particles. And that in fact is exactly what we saw yesterday in the, uh, in, in the standard model effective field theory. When you have these possibilities, the, the structure is already in the infrared structure of QCD because it's just that general. This is all you can have. Uh, yes. Ah, but you see the whole jet exchange gluons. Okay, this, this, those soft particles can't resolve the jet. All they see is the jet's direction and color charge. And they see that, that in fact, as a light-like color charge. So all the soft stuff of the world sees the jets as single, single uh, so-called iconal lines. Iconal in this case means it doesn't recoil. It's just a source of gluon switches. Yes, it does. In this case, this is not just any old jet. I mean, and you have, to, I say it, it doesn't work this simply for every quantity, but for this elastic scattering in this infrared completed dimensionally regularized QCD, this works exactly. Alrighty. Uh, so the next few slides say what uh, some of the consequences of this for uh, elastic scattering amplitudes. We really won't have time to follow these. Uh, this is just a picture that we had before of jet functions, uh, product of jet functions two to two. Here's our soft function. Here's our hard function. Um, all of these dimension uh, have to be, yes, dimensionally regularized. No, the collinear divergences are. Yes. Uh, so here well, they're here. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, this. Oh no, C here is just a point like coupling of the, it's the color exchange at short distances. So in fact, this H knows which colors are coming in and out and they match this. Okay. It's, it depends on how you define these things. The way that I like to define them is they have the collinear subtracted out and absorbed into the definition of the jet functions. Okay. But you can do it differently. In soft collinear effective theory, it's done differently. They keep collinear in the soft and generally take the soft out of the jet. I like to keep soft and collinear in the jet, which factorizes and this leaves the soft all by itself. Well, you have to look at Yao Ma's paper in 2020 for the complete 90 page details. But for each region, region by region, meaning where certain lines are collinear and others are soft, you can see that this structure holds very early on. Also it was done, and what Yao Ma did was doing it in uh, Feynman gauge. It was done in axial gauge in considerable detail by Ashok Sen of string theory fame back in a long time ago. <laughs> okay. So uh, the next few slides just follow these ideas and say what forms they give to you for the jet functions. Notice that the jet functions are integrals which give rise to these one of epsilon poles. And so it's all explicit. The collinear singularities for a gluon in one direction and for a quark in another direction and for an anti-quark in a third direction, all completely factorized and separated. And this, these have been, I mean, in addition to the general arguments, uh, they have been uh, verified to, you know, pretty sophisticated and high order uh, calculations. Okay, this is what the soft functions, Uh, 
Oh, no, not everything is the same, but it's the same. It's it's similar. <laughs> In fact, what what? Okay, let me not try to. This is for the amplitudes. Okay, everything here is for the amplitudes, and the idea I'm trying to get across is we have ways of looking at the amplitudes at all orders. We know where the the singularities or the poles come from, the infrared poles come from, and knowing that we're actually able to get very explicit formulas for these poles as in, in, in a form where they exponentiate. Mm. I'm afraid I'm going to have to take a little bit sip of water here. Okay. Oh, and by the way, I mean, the fact that these, the soft function, where is the soft function? Yeah, the soft function is some path ordered exponential of a matrix anomalous dimension. This was exactly shown in the discussion of the uh, standard model effective theory, field theory for point-like interactions added to the standard model, which couple the quarks or quarks and gluons like this, say at, at some higher order. And um, it's it works that way in the effective theory because it's there in the original theory in the separation of hard scattering with long distance behavior. And these are some uh, diagrams that contribute. Uh, let's not get into that. Okay, so we have about 25 minutes, <laughs> roughly speaking, to uh, talk about how these general viewpoints lead to general results. And now I like to put everything together, okay, in the last five minutes. Okay, luckily it's more than that. So we're going to, uh, I think, slide 110. So we're, we're kind of pretty close. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Infrared logarithms arise from coalescing mass shell, that is K squared equals zero, poles in loop integrals. That's all we've been discussing over the past hour or so. So this is Landau equations with the so-called Coleman-Norton analysis in terms of these physical pictures. Uh, and then this is this is where I learned it, <laughs> okay. So what we want is not these. I mean, you can get all this wonderful stuff about amplitudes, the infrared poles of amplitudes from this analysis, but it's not the real world, right? It's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's a quantum field theory problem of extreme interest, but it's not QCD in the real world. We're looking for infrared safe stuff. So how can we use this to identify it? So the basic finding is long distance behavior goes like classical propagation and massless field theory. So it's actually another thing is the analog of the correspondence principle where classical and quantum pictures overlap. Jet substructure, as we've said, is a long distance dominated because massless particles can propagate elastic classically between interactions, like when they split, when they recombine, scatter among uh, particle. Uh, uh, cold and moving particles. Such configurations are very restrictive at high energies. As we saw for that elastic scattering, it's just like boring jets going out in every direction. It's all you have. And then some soft stuff in the middle. And they reduce, in fact, to parton model-like pictures. Because if you think about it, those pictures that we saw for two to two scattering were just like the partons. It's like the partons came in, they scattered, they went out. There were unphysically polarized gluons. Well, you don't have those in the parton model. And then it becomes like the fight of the fourth picture, where it's just two coming in, two going out at short distances. The rest was renormalization of the of the two point of the self energy. <clears throat> so here it is. This is everything. <laughs> everything at all possible accelerators. <laughs> okay, the classical kinematics is embedded in amplitudes. And these are the underlying singular regions. This is where all logs come from for wide angle, if for hard scattering. Okay, lepton, anti-lepton, your Z plus, E minus annihilates to a vector, and then some jets come out, okay? And these double lines, the black lines, represent jet subdiagrams. For the moment, we're setting aside the salt, all right? Lepton hadron, here's our electrons, here's our photon, here's a incoming, Hadron, it has a number of partons. One of them scatters, produces several jets moving in various directions, and the other guys go forward. Once these guys go forward, 
they also can't exchange finite momentum with the outgoing jets. Everything has to happen in short distances. So it all comes down to here. And at the pinch surface, to get the logarithmic behavior, these guys simply can't take part in this hard scattering. If they did, they would have been very, very close, and that would give it, give it another suppression because we would be restricting them to a tiny region of phase space. Hadron, hadron, again, the picture in terms of finite momentum particles is, is the, exactly the same thing. These two collide, everybody else goes forward. It's possible we could have another hard scattering, but again, that would be suppressed because any hard scattering is unlikely. And when we get the hard scattering, we get a set of jets going out. And these are all the physical pictures there are at leading power. Okay. In each case, the interactions between outgoing jets involves no local momentum transfers. The logarithms we organize in evolution or resummation result from integrals up to these momentum configurations. These are momentum configurations exact. This is where the pinch surfaces are. The physical pictures associated with those pinch surfaces are very simple. Of course, each of these black lines, we have a bunch of collinear gluons and quarks, you know, it gets complicated, but they're all going in the same direction and sharing the same total jet momentum. Now here, the jet momentum may appear as many particles in the final state because we're thinking about inclusive crosses. Okay. So in the gauge theory, all of these guys, this is our hadron-hadron scattering, we have to let all these soft guys occur. So now we'd like to have a little bit more about how jet cross sections and what we'd like to say is impose locality because that will be the key to us. So we'll talk about leptonic annihilation and take a moment and go back to the total cross section, which we talked about a little bit in, in the most recent lecture. In leptonic annihilation, as in all cases, the final states are familiar hadrons, pions, and protons. E plus E minus goes to hadrons, have some uh, form, for example, of from the QCD vacuum, the photon couples to an electromagnetic current, the electromagnetic current produces set N, we take the absolute square of this and we sum over n. Here, I'm just simplifying things by making this trace, but really this is you know, contracted with a leptonic vector. On the other hand, the sum over n, 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 even if it's pions and protons, in fact, especially if it's pions and protons, the sum over n, n is equal to one. And then it's uh, simple enough to turn the delta function into an integral over x, and find that the total cross section is proportional to the imaginary part of the forward scattering cross section, which in this case is simply a the electromagnetic and the electromagnetic uh, fields. So this is a general form of unitarity that says if you sum over all possible final states, you get the imaginary part of the forward scattering amplitude. That's the optical theorem that we talked about before. Here it's illustrated for two particles in the initial state for some reason, uh, but it could have been just the uh, single uh, photon in the final state. So on the right-hand side, there is no classical pictures connecting the place where this uh, electromagnetic field absorbed the particles and here where they emerged from. So because there are no classical pictures in the self-energy, in other words, the self-energy is something like, okay, here is where J appears and some particles start moving away from J. And you say, well, if we're gonna get singularities, they have to be light-like. But if they're light-like, and there are say only two of them, they're moving back to back, receding from each other at the speed of light. The game is over. There's no way for them to come back, interact again to produce the outgoing photon. There's just no classical picture. Therefore, there are no pinches. No pinches, no long distance behavior, and our quantity is three words. <laughs> the first one beginning with I. No, class <laughs> no classical processes, no classical pictures. So we can do the integral without having any pinches. So we would say the integral for this quantity, the forward scattering amplitude, whose imaginary part we're gonna take, this integral is, thank you, infrared safe, okay? So it all, that's it, all orders. 
all right? Okay, that's just for the total cross-section. But in fact, that's how you show that the total cross-section is infrared safe in E plus E minus annihilation. Now we can go on. What about jet cross-sections, okay? So it depends on how we define them, which we're not gonna get too much into the detail, but we want to define them in a way that we know it's a jet and the jet, that, the jet's got a bunch of particles moving with a lot of energy in a certain direction. So we say, oh, if we're really interested in just the energy flow, we can respect the energy flow. But if we can respect the energy flow, we're summing over all these different states with different collinear rearrangements and they all get the same weight. So we're just adding them together. So we get the feeling that, yeah, maybe this thing is finite. And the beauty of it is, so here it's more complicated. So we'll say, say E plus E minus goes to jets. We sum over all the states as we did before, same matrix elements, zero, J-E-M, N, N, J-E-M, zero. But now we have a sort of theta function that says N is an element of the set of jet states, however we define those. But we want to define them in a way that satisfies the flow of energy. So each, and here's where the beautiful part of the, the whole point of this time order perturbation theory comes in finally, each of these jet related states has its own unitarity, okay? So if here's the general thing, and this is by the way, reverse unitarity over and over. You start out with this, remember, this is what uh, uh, Lance wrote on the board yesterday. And now you say, okay, suppose I had a cross section. So it had an amplitude where I had all EIs minus SIs plus I epsilon. I have a complex conjugate EJ minus SJ minus I epsilon. And I have energy conservation for the final state. I just take every one of, and what I do is I'm summing over all the final states in a sequence of time ordered states. Okay, so it's completely arbitrary. I apply this and what I find is if I have N, so this M equal one to N, so this is uh, nth order in some interaction, arbitrary nth order, I take each delta function, replace it by this, I get two n terms where I had before n terms, but every pair of terms cancels except for the first term and the last term. And I get a product i j equal one to n of all terms with plus i epsilon, it comes in with a minus sign, and then another one j equal one to n with all minus i epsilon to multiply by minus i, that's what gives you the imaginary part. Now, in these integrals, the pinches disappear. There were lots and lots of pinches depending upon how we identified, you know, what final states we were ready to identify as jet-like states. And there are plus i epsilons here, minus i epsilons there, the pinches, it's complicated. But just as in the case of the Higgs production calculation, you use this trick, except it turns out this trick works at all orders. And it leaves, it leaves us with these EJ minus SJ, plus I epsilons here, minus I epsilons there, and our pinches have disappeared. We didn't need, and the thing about this is, we didn't need to integrate over the three momenta. This is an identity at fixed loop momenta and phase space momenta to all orders in time ordered perturbation theory, which as we saw, can be derived graph by graph from covariant perturbation theory. So therefore, if we choose our final states correctly so that we can sum over these all these final states in, because they all differ by, by rearrangements of momentum, we're going to find that all the singularities will cancel from those. Now, uh, Okay, well, we're getting there. We just have a few more slides. Summing over jet-related states, that is to say states that have the same energy flow, removes all the pinches in long-time behavior. And this is, again, an all-order statement that we got out of the kind of simple considerations that we had. And there are some comments here about literature, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, so now here, these are things which we saw uh, from Maria's talk. So. This is like a picture of deep inelastic scattering, a hard scattering function, part-time distribution, summing over quarks, anti-quarks, 
and gluons in this kind of factorized form. So this is what collinear factorization uh, consists of. And um, what we'd like to do is to say what our, our methods say about this and why we believe that this is a way which we can use to prove these kinds of results. Obviously, we're not going to prove them in the last 10 minutes, but we have 10 whole minutes. So. Uh, next is a picture of hadron-hadron scattering. In this case, it, uh, rather than Drellian final state, it's maybe a two jet final state. So we see where our long distance behavior is gonna come from the outgoing jets. And we could ask, well, does these uh, uh, ideas apply? Well, obviously they don't apply completely because unlike E plus E minus, here we have two hadrons in the initial state and uh, in deep and elastic scattering, we had one. So what do we do about these initial states? And of course, what we do is we want to say that they can, their effects can be factored into a uh, part-time distributions times a hard scattering function. And the infrared safety we'd like to verify is sitting here. We'd like to verify that along with the universality of these two Fs. And uh, what I've tried to do is to mass and have a discussion of the kind of, of reasoning that goes into making those sorts of proofs. Uh, there's some words here that are kind of historically motivated. Um, but I just, what I want to do before uh, giving, okay, so here, let me just give you an idea of how one can approach steps on the road to factorization, okay? So we could ask, um, oh, here's a pinch surface. And if you think about it, yeah, this is, this is really how pinch surfaces go. You're coming in from the past in this direction and this direction. This is from an old paper, but I hope the picture is clear enough. This is a picture of the pinch surface. Here we have particle P1. It has a jet here. This is what we'd like to be the parton distribution. And here we have another one where we'd like that to be the parton distribution. Notice these are going in different directions, so they can't scatter more than once off of each other just by dimensional counting, this gives the leading behavior. So, and then there's a final state that might be a little bit complicated. It could have two jets, could have three jets, could be a Higgs or, or whatever. But now it could be a Higgs plus jet. There are also these soft lines and the soft lines are what make it complicated in this case. So we could say the soft lines could connect to these jet sub diagrams and they could also connect to the hard part, but the hard part is here outgoing jets. So we can't say that in any given final state C, this thing has uh, reduced to a short distance phenomenon. We haven't canceled anything. This is on the left, the absolute positive, most general leading pin surface we'll ever find, okay? So now we say, oh, all right. Okay, but we had a diagram. And we know we can apply, we can say in principle, I could make this into a time order diagram. And I know that in fact, if I sum over all the cuts of this diagram, then in fact, I would have the imaginary part of the diagram. All right. So this, however, is only some of the cuts of the diagram. It's not all of them. So what we get is, in this equation, we say the sum of our cuts, say that involves the Higgs, say Higgs plus jet, is equal to the imaginary part of the diagram minus cuts that appear here, C prime, which use the soft guys to make a cut. So some of the soft guys could have appeared here, and uh, but we didn't have the Higgs produced. So the Higgs is all a virtual correction. And here, the Higgs is all a virtual correction if these are C double prime cuts that are before the hard scattering occurs, right? So the cuts could be before the hard scattering, after the hard scattering, but before the hard scattering ends or after the second hard scattering on all the way to the right in this, in what is essentially the imaginary part of this forward scattering amplitude. But now here you have interactions of soft particles with the outgoing jets but you look on the right-hand side and you say, oh, gee, um, let's look at this in a little bit more detail. In each of these, the hard scattering appears at one point and comes back to another point where the, the forward scattering reforms itself, but there are no pinches anymore. 
all the pinches associated with the final state have disappeared in these cuts because any loop you have around here that carries finite momentum isn't pinched because there's no, how do we know? Because there's no physical process here, just as there wasn't in the total cross section in which particles emerged from some point and came back to the same point. They can't do it. Therefore, in fact, the sum of all of these things reduces to these kinds of, of situations where the hard part is shrunk to a point and now a soft particle would like to couple to that point. And yes, it can couple to that point. When you do the integral, you'll encounter those points, but they will not be singular enough because you're demanding that a very long wavelength line sit at a given point, so it's geometrically suppressed. Or you do the power counting, it'll be suppressed by a power. <laughs> Therefore, once we sum over all the Cs, we can, if the soft part cannot interact with the outgoing jets. And from the outgoing jets point of view, it's all just like E plus E minus annihilation. Therefore, jet cross sections at the hadron hadron collider can be factorized. However, it is true that what will remain is the possibility of having soft interactions from this analysis between this jet and that jet, which also have to be eliminated to prove the full factorization in universality. And just to show you, uh, oh, this, this, by the way, is what part-time distributions look like. I don't know, it's possible Marie will show something like this uh, in, all right, we'll wrap it up very quickly. Uh, this, uh, as expectation values of operators of this form. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, so what I wanted to emphasize here was that when you go through this exercise, you find part-time distributions which can be expressed as matrix elements of QCD, which enables you to go to the computers in principle and calculate them if you could, but in any case gives you well-defined ways to define them on the basis of experiment in self-consistent manner. Anyway, the way it goes is after, so this is sort of the steps to factorization here, and this is actually the last slide. Um, this is where we start out. These are the cross sections we wanted. And here we can imagine, this is uh, Drellian here, but there could have been, these could have been, this could have been a gluon, these could be two jets. We just argued in complete generality that so, at all soft interactions coupled to the outgoing jets, either between them and the incoming particles or between the outgoing jets, each other will cancel as we sum over all final states in a jet cross section that satisfies the respects the, the flow of momentum. So the first step from here to here, you notice the difference is that there aren't lines from the soft blob here to the outgoing jet. So now we're faced with the problem of what happens about soft lines uh, attaching to attaching the two uh, would-be part-time distributions like this, and the possibility, of course, we want to understand what happens with these. So these scalar polarized lines, <clears throat> which are also uh, consistent with leading power behavior. And the third step here just simply factorizes the scalar polarized lines from the hard part using the ward identities of QCD. The difficult part is this last part, where we show the cancellation of soft connections attaching jet A and jet B to get to the point where we have jet A and jet B in a form that we could actually identify with the matrix elements that I showed on the previous slide. This last part is the most difficult part. Obviously, I can't um, go through all of the, the details here in like two minutes. I should say that the main uh, problem is that uh, region that I described before is the Glauber region. It's a place where if you do the power counting, you find that the integral, after you look at the leading behavior as k goes to zero, the integral has extra pieces, uh, extra pinches, where certain components of k are actually going to zero faster than others. What it does actually is it's, it's a region where the soft gluon resolves this jet. 
Now, the way it works itself out is the fact that, again, you sum over final states. Different final states where the soft gluon can see the, uh, the different components of the jet, and you find that there's enough cancellation by summing over final states that these soft singularities all factor and cancel among themselves. So I'll just leave it by that as a kind of summary of how we do it. So, uh, yeah, these are the basic results underlying hard scattering analysis. Uh, some comments, uh, on uh, some of the practical applications follow. There's some talking about JET. You know, some of you will have seen it, parts of it or all of it. Some of you may know more than I do about JET algorithms, about uh, what energy flow looks like at CMS and Atlas and things like that. Uh, there's about, you know, perhaps 20 more slides, but we're certainly not going to uh, <laughs> impose them on anybody. Uh, so in, in including a sketch of how, uh, Factorization properties are uh, connected to resummation. I will finish by going back, however. And this one, uh, one transparency that I added after having hearing Maria's um, talk, we saw a beautiful derivation of the nitty gritty of how uh, the DGLAP evolution is identified and how the splitting functions are calculated. Here it is in the language that we developed over, over this period, deep and elastic cross-section at some Q. So this is E on a hadron H. It's a sum over partons A, the scattering of electron on A in uh, corrected and perturbative QCD. So it's a function of Q over mu and alpha S of mu. And convoluted in the language that Maria's used and also notation that Lance used, with a parton distribution, which is a function of alpha S of mu. We're not worried about the X and the Z and things like that. That's in the convolution. The left-hand side, the one we measure, is independent of the mu we choose, mu d by d mu equals zero, which requires that mu d by d mu of this convolution equals zero, which in turn requires that mu d by d mu of H is equal to H convoluted with some function P, which is equal to minus P convoluted with phi, and phi has to, mu d by d mu of phi has to, and this left-hand side here should be mu d by d mu of phi. And the thing where P is, is just a function that can be calculated starting at, at one loop. The thing about it is that this P, we can get entirely by a calculation on H. We don't have to touch the infrared sensitive part-time distribution to find out what P is. We can also do it and reinterpret it as the renormalization of the part-time distribution, which can be done and perhaps in some ways it's a, a more direct way. But in principle, P is available because the information is in H. In fact, at one loop, it's just the coefficient of the log of mu. And this is generally true to all orders. This is the pattern which it takes, which follows from evolution. Resummations, almost always, in fact, every case I know uh, in, in hard scattering can be computed using the same uh, philosophy. Sometimes you have two equations rather than one, and that's the philosophy also used in the effective theories. So the splitting functions PAB, because they can be gotten from H, are themselves infrared safe. This is DGLAP evolution, applies in DIS and inclusive, and resummations in the same fashion. So we kind of touched all the bases, some more dwelling on some more than others. I want to thank you guys for your attention uh, over this, this uh, short and intense period. <laughs> so, okay, that's what I had to say. All right. Lance. That. No, no, the Glauber story is exactly the same. The point is getting to the Glauber story. The Glauber, okay, it's all in there.
This eliminates soft interactions with outgoing particles at wide angles, whether they're the muons in Drillian or they're jets. And so once you've eliminated those, you've reduced it to this situation here in the box two. This H could be anything that would be infrared safe if it were produced in E plus E minus annihilation or you know something like it because we, okay, so that, so that step, the factorization, the, the fact that jet cross sections for most purposes, if they're inclusive enough, and it, okay, this is a, a little bit uh, vague in, in that way of expressing it, they act from that point of view the same as Drillian. It seems to be something that kind of fell by the wayside over the years. I, th I think there isn't as much awareness of that as perhaps there should be. On the other hand, the uncertainties there and the, are the same as the uncertainties in Drillian in terms of uh, you know the rigor of 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 the proofs, which are pretty good, but I mean, they could use improvement. What's that? A, Hig a Higgs? Yes, yes. It well, you see, we didn't have to say what was in the blob. It followed from unitarity. That that's the thing. It was the unitarity which is built into. It's built into the theory. So what do we need for unitarity? We need a Hermitian Hamiltonian. Nobody says that Hamiltonian has to even be rotationally invariant. It could be the Hamiltonian like in an effective theory that just produces jets in some fixed direction. The long, those, that theory, which only produces particles say in some jet directions, be it soft collinear and other theory, has a Hermitian Hamiltonian. When you sum over all its final states, the total probability has to, whoops, excuse me, equal one. And that's where the cancellation of infrared divergences comes in. But the only way to do that is to sum over all the states for a given Hermitian Hamiltonian. And the Hermitian Hamiltonian for jets would be like a soft collinear Hermitian Hamiltonian or interaction Lagrangian. Okay, it's that, it's the, it's the hermeticity that matters. But the hermeticity means that if you do one to two, you better do two to one because that's phi star going to five for each of the fields. So you have to have, as well as collinear splitting, collinear absorption or, or recombination. So it's extremely general. Have a cookie. Yeah. Thank you. And really, I want to say you guys have been great. <laughs> you put up with a lot of talk here. <laughs> I mean, for me, the rest of us.